We've been down this road before. Mega mining companies promising upliftment and jobs in exchange for gouging millions of tons of sand from a pristine coastline. But when the dunes in danger are along more than 20 kilometers of the wild coast, serious questions have to be asked, and Bongani is going to do just that. More than 10 years ago, a mining company on the hunt for minerals found the 10th largest titanium deposit in the world, right here on this pristine stretch of the wild coast. Now an Australian mining company through their South African subsidiary have applied to mine the Klodobini dunes just 30 kilometers south of Port Edward and within sight of the wild coast sun. For mining to happen, some of these locals will have to move. And it may well happen over their dead bodies. Last year, Transworld Energy and Mineral Resources lodged the application for rights to mine these dunes for 22 years. The decision made by the Department of Minerals and Energy was expected in February, but has been delayed to April. I don't know how they're going to mine an area which is a protected land according to decree. For the past seven years, Sineku Kusukulu, an environmentalist, has been dedicated to saving his home and his people's heritage. He's the founding member of Sustaining the Wild Coast, working closely with Conservation International. So the land is protected from cottages but not from mining? That's, uh, it looks like. The process is well underway. The environmental impact assessment is complete. The public meetings are over. The stage is pretty much set. If mining gets the green light, it will gouge a total of 320 million tons of sand bearing heavy minerals from a 22 kilometer stretch of coastline from Zamba River in the north to Mtentu River in the south, just five kilometers from this site, which has unrivaled tourism potential. Now, instead of these eco-friendly lodges in the neighborhood, this kind of environmental degradation is on the cards for the Pondo people's backyard and raging environmentalists. Because you've got a high number of species in a small area, but highly threatened by human activities. And in terms of, uh, of that, this is an area which is, needs to be given high priority in, in as far as conservation is concerned. Even though this area is protected by a number of environmental acts, it seems hard to believe that when it comes to mining, the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism has no real authority except to advise the Department of Minerals and Energy who have the last word. In terms of this area, which is earmarked for mining, it is part of the Pondoland Centre of Endemism, which is um, an area which has got close to 200 um, endemic plants, which are not found anywhere else in the world. Holding more plant species than the UK, the International Conservation Union has designated Pondoland a biodiversity hotspot. People would argue that, no, you can't talk about plants and butterflies and, 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 and all that, but we are, as a country, we are signatory to some international conventions and as, as a country we have got the, the, the environmental laws we are supposed to protect. But the Department of Minerals and Energy are about to make a major part of their decision based on environmental impact assessment that has been criticised for being fatally flawed. According to the EIA that the wetlands will not be affected because they are not going to touch them. But if you dig 8 metres that's definitely going to affect the water quality, the quality of, of, of those the estuaries. Objections to the environmental impact assessment have been issued by Sustaining the Wild Coast, the Amadiba Crisis Committee, the Wildlife Environment Society of South Africa and Sun International has also objected, stating that the full impact on the resort and the environment hasn't been considered. And with the dry sand mining, the amount of dust which will be flying around, and no one is telling the people about all of those things. This is a stark reminder of the hard-fought battle 11 years ago when Richards Bay Minerals tried to lay claim to the dunes of St. Lucia on the KwaZulu-Natal north coast. But the broader fight here is about protecting the people's rights. And if any decision is taken, decision makers must listen to the people of Kolobin. The people who live on this stretch of the wild coast may not have much, but they do have their land. A huge part of their opposition to the mining project is that it would dispossess them of their birthright. And they are intimately connected to this land. Many of their food gardens lie right next to the mining area and they'll be cut off from large tracts of their grazing land. 
The general feel from this community is that nobody has asked them anything about mining. Nobody has asked when it's going to happen, if they would like to see it happen. They say they are ready to give up their lives before they see mining happen in this community. I'm afraid because the people are very angry. Community member Nandle Mbutuma is an activist. She believes she lost her job as a tour guide because the focus changed from one of ecotourism to mining. And if the, uh, the, the, the pond of people are, are, are angry, they do something. And the anger has divided this community so much so that it's claimed that Beauty Lamini's husband, who was outspoken against the mining, was poisoned just last month. Of course, mining will bring benefits. Benefits to who and costs to who? Who's going to pay ultimately? John Clark is a social worker and community liaison for sustaining the Wild Coast. He's lodged several violations to the Human Rights Commission. But the way this particular proposal has come about has been so much in violation of human rights and so much exploitation, so much sort of deception. The Human Rights Commission concluded from their independent investigations that Although the community has little or no information about the mining development, a vast majority of people within the community are against the proposed development. But MRC Australia claim to have unanimous support from the locals. We have heard rumours that government will issue the licence on the basis that the people want it. And what makes things worse is that people are being manipulated to support mining. In December, people were bused to Pretoria to deliver a pro-mining petition to Minerals and Energy Minister Biera Sonjita. But Sarah Sefton from Grahamstown's Legal Resource Centre says the majority of supporters were from an inland group and not from the community will be directly affected by the mining. People have been uh, told that they must write their names down if they want to have access to electricity. They then later find out that this uh, supposedly a petition in favour of the mine. Sarah represents the Amadiba Crisis Committee, a group of about 800 people who will feel the brunt of the mining. Her main concern is the lack of information. <laughs> Well, that left a few questions for Mineral Commodities CEO Mark Caruso in Australia to answer. If you have nothing to hide, why do you refuse to talk to the South African but media? Not, okay, okay, so obviously what part of it don't they understand? I've said that there's no interview in the software record. I've got to go now. Well, that didn't work. He had a lot to say, but none of it on the record. So what exactly is Mineral Commodities' track record? They have strategic investments in Allied Gold Limited with productions in Papua New Guinea, shares in diamond concessions in Sierra Leone, and mineral sands projects in Namibia, and they've already been awarded the license to mine minerals on our west coast. Their objective is to become a significant heavy mineral producer, supplying niche markets within three to five years. The conflict here is between those who seek to maximize profits in the short term and those who seek to optimize benefits in the long term. And if they scoop the Wild Coast dunes of Tolobeni on the East Coast, their prize is reputed to be worth a cool 8.9 billion rand. According to the shareholders agreement, there are three shareholders. MRC Resources with 56%, a BE partner, Zolko, has 26%, and 18% is held by SGF nominees as nominees for third parties. The agreement between the BEE company, Zolko, and the Amadiba community ensures that future benefits flow directly to the local community, but Sarah is skeptical. But we've been told Zolko was specifically formed to represent the local communities. They're a black empowerment group, they're a group of businessmen. They're not community members and they're not there to benefit the local community. But Zolko, together with the mining companies, are touting mining as a panacea for poverty in the area. What impresses you about the document? One, is that the mining is coming with the electricity. Two, is that the mining is coming with the roads. Nkululek Omsabane, a school principal and one of six directors of the BEE company, is very excited. Speaking in his own capacity, he waxed lyrical about the benefits mining would bring. Mining is coming to skill the people who are going to work there. Skill them to do what? Engineering, all those things. Due to the low skills level of many of the people in the local community, there's no, under, there's no indication that many of them will receive jobs in the long term. And there's also no specific undertaking that X percent of the jobs will go to people from the local community. 
For reasons quite unbeknown to us, Zolko representatives refused to be interviewed. Let the process go. Why, why would you want to stop it? Zolega Kapa is the mayor of Oatambo district where the proposed mining will take place. She believes ecotourism and mining can coexist. I do know there will be massive jobs. Th- In the official happen. application, it says 347 permanent jobs. Yes. That's all. Let never mind the number. That does not involve the spin-offs. That will obviously improve the situation with the roads, but there's no indication that it's going to improve the schools, that it's going to bring any other much-needed infrastructure. And there's nothing to suggest that once the license has been awarded to transport energy and mineral resources, they won't just sell it off. So we contacted John Barnes, their CEO in Durban, for answers. Morning, John Barnes. John Barnes was the former exploration geologist for Richards Bay Minerals, and he didn't give us a very good reception. We're just trying to get a balanced view of what's going on down there. We've spoken to everybody else, and we'd just like your side of the story. Well, I'm afraid that is our side of the story, so we won't be going any further. Thank you. Bye-bye. But we... So how exactly has mining become the only option for a better life? According to local and international reports, ecotourism trumps mining as far as sustainability goes. And should mining take place, this beautiful location could lose its luster in the ecotourism market. Nontle worked for Amadiba Adventures who ran Mtendu Camp, which is now run down. So how do you feel that the tourists have stopped coming? My heart is broken because tourism hired a lot of people. Mtentu was one of the lodges Wilderness Safaris was going to transform. By now we would have been in the fourth year and we would have been delivering close to a million rand every single year into that area in the form of cash, jobs, uh, turnover, all these different things. No longer interested in investing in rural South Africa, Colin has retired from Wilderness Safaris but still believes there were people deliberately undermining the deal. Can a leopard change its spots? Well, it seems interesting that when the prospect of mining came along, one of the directors of Amadiba Adventures, the custodians of ecotourism in the area, Zamile Kunya, formed Zolka, the BEE company with a stake in the mining project. In fact, one of Zolka's directors remains a director of Amadiba Adventures to this very day. The people that I was with the community, with the tourism, were now with the mining. And they are the people now who are saying, no man, change your mind. We've changed ours. When it came down to the final signing, then suddenly that's when the mining guys realized that there was problems. And the folks who were in charge of the community trust suddenly switched. And they did everything in their powers to make sure that that document was never finally signed. Can you explain how that switch happened? That that's the manipulation, that's the corruption, because those people who acquired those shares to form the B company are still the directors of the ecotourism. Zamile Kunya has since resigned from Zolko and we were told he's now a liaison between the mining companies, Zolko and the community. We've come to the end of the road, literally. To get from here to the dunes where mining will take place, you have to walk. Between there are people's homes and their fields, which will have to be relocated to make way for the mining. Somewhere around a thousand people directly affected that are going to have to be relocated. No, no, there's no such. No one's going to be relocated. No one. There is no plan on how people who have been who are going to be displaced by the mine will actually be dealt with, what compensation they will be offered, what alternatives they'll have for grazing their cattle. That has not been addressed at all. How could this possibly be granted? We think that there's insufficient information for her to take a decision. And if she goes ahead and takes a decision, then we will apply to the court to have that decision set aside. So the lives of the Amadiba clan hang in the balance while government trades with their future. By the time this baby girl is 22 years old, the mining company would have exhausted their loot, leaving nothing for her but a changed place. Well, comments on the mining proposal by the Department of Environmental Affairs were signed by the 20th of December last year, but they were not submitted by the due date. In fact, the report was only sent across in March. Now, why? An administrative error during the festive season, and that's official. As John Clark says, suspicion and rumour will continue. After the break, call her Teron or Theron. Charlize is a star by any name. We bagged an exclusive interview with the Oscar winner on her recent trip home.